up with your box? That's not mine. <laughs> oh, well, how long has it been here? Since before I got here. I don't know. It's not my. It's not my problem. Well, what is it? It's a problem. Oh, it's a problem. Right. Well, should I look at it? Knock yourself out. Uh, but you might want to think about that. Oh, why? Well, like I said, that's a problem. Well, whose problem is it? I don't know. It was here before I got here. Wait, so you don't know whose it is? No, and honestly, I don't really care. I've got more important things to do. Yeah, well, someone has to care. I mean, you can't just sit here forever. It's got to be someone's problem. Why? Why does it have to be someone's problem? Just don't look at it. Pretend it's not even there. Hey, <laughs> there is no problem. What? That doesn't make any sense to me. OK, wait, so what you're saying is it's not your problem. Right. And it's not my problem. Yeah. <laughs> then whose problem is it? Sometimes it is like that in life. I'm a parent, and if that problem were at my house, I would know exactly what that is. It's a child in a box, and um, I would know how to handle that. But we come across things a lot of times that are problems, but yet um, we don't maybe, or maybe we say it's nothing I intend to do uh, to, to work with. I don't intend to do anything about this problem. Other times, we just don't think about it. Some of you uh, you arrived here today by the skin of your teeth. It's only God's grace that you got in the door. Maybe it was a tough ride in the minivan. Uh, maybe you just had a bad morning. You got here, and you can't think of anything else. You're just happy that you made it in the door. And so to now be, begin to think about the problems that are going on around you, uh, that's just too much. And sometimes we ignore problems because we think it's someone else's responsibility. You know, I do this at home sometimes. I'll leave something out. Well, you know, my wife should put that away. And I think she leaves it out thinking he should put that away. And it sits there for months, you know, because no one will put it away. That's not entirely true. Someone eventually puts it away. But we look at something and we say, not my problem. Not going to worry about it. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at 2 John. And as we looked at 2 John, we saw really the heart of John come out in this passage, in that, that letter, as it had in the previous letters. You know, John was concerned with the, the people that he was writing to, uh, that they behave appropriately, that they believe what is important about Jesus, and that they love one another. And that was clear in 2 John. It's clear in 3 John as well. In 2 John, he made a little more of an effort to point out the importance to stand on what is true, to have a, a distinct understanding and a unique commitment to the truth such that everything that we do as Christians should be informed by the truth of who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, and why that matters for us. So two weeks ago, we called the sermon, Don't Just Do Something, Stand There. Know where your truth lies. Know where your commitment is. But that's just really half of John's message. Uh, John Stott, a, a scholar, a Christian theologian, says that John 2 and 3 should really be read together. Because if we were to say that John 2 tells us not to just do things, but to stand on truth, John 3 tells us don't just stand there, do something. That as believers, we have a responsibility to the problems, both in the church and outside of the church, to not ignore them, to not act as though they're going away, but instead to do something about them. And so this morning, as we go to 3 John, it's on page 1,307 in your pew Bibles, as we go there, this is our encouragement to one another, that we've got to do something, that we have to do something. In this letter that John is writing, it's not a letter addressed to an entire church, but a specific leader of a specific church. His name is Gaius. And John tells Gaius and talks to Gaius about his, his affection for him. He warns him about false teachers, as John is known to do. But he also tells him, listen, will there be people that will come and try and, and distract you? Yes, but there's also people that are going to come that are worthy of your support. There's people that will come before you who you need to go out of your way to support because they are standing on the truth. In these situations, when you come across teachers, really teachers who are deceptive and then teachers who have embraced the truth, in both contexts, you must, as a believer, do something. That's what John is saying. We have to do 
something. So I want to invite you to stand if you're able, and we're going to read all of 3 John together. And this is, uh, this is John writing. He says, The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you, and that you may be in good health, as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth. Indeed, you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear my children are walking in the truth. Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these, that we may be fellow workers for the truth. I have written something to the church, but Diophatrice, who, put, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. I not, and not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers and also stops those who want to and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you, and greet the friends each by name. Father, will you add a blessing to the reading of this word? May, may my words be clear today. May your spirit move. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So these first, uh, these first four verses remind us of what we've seen from the very beginning of this series. It reminds us of the pastoral heart of John. That John is writing not just as some sort of theo theologian from a, a early century ivory tower, but rather he's writing as a pastor. He's writing as someone who cares about the spiritual health of those to whom he is writing. His message hasn't changed. It's always been, watch your behavior, know who Jesus is, love each other. And that works its way out as a pastor in the way that he has a spiritual concern for the health of other people, for the spiritual health. You see how he begins his letter. He's writing to this man who he says he loves in the truth. And there's this great affection that he has for him. And he says that he hopes that he is in good health physically, but also spiritually. He says, as it is well with your soul. John is concerned that the, the health of Gaius matches his spiritual health, that his physical health and spiritual health match. John is demonstrating that he cares about the spiritual health of the people he is around. And this, I think, is a good model for us. Because many times, as I said earlier, we come to church barely able to function on our own, and we come and we sit down, and our intent is to be fed. And it's, it, it, it has a bit of a selfish notion to it. I'm not saying it's wrong to come and expect something for yourself at church. All right, When we come together expecting the Spirit to, to communicate something to you from the Word, I think that's good. But sometimes we become so insulated that we don't pay any kind of attention to the people around us. We've talked before about the importance of a believer confronting a believer when they see sin in their life, and I'm not even talking about that. What, what do you do when you come to this church and you sit in the same place uh, most weeks, and for three weeks in a row, the people that usually are next to you aren't there? What, do you just lean over to whoever's next to you and say, I wonder where the Smiths are? Do you have a concern for them spiritually? Do you reach out and say, hey, where have you been? Do you send them a text message? Do you send an email? Do you send them a Facebook message? Do you tweet them? What do you do? When someone continually misses Bible study, do you have a concern for them? Do you, do you want to know what's going on? What about if someone's social media posts grow darker and darker? Do you reach out and do you say, hey, what's going on? Are you showing a concern for the spiritual life of other people? A few years ago, someone uh, that I grew up with posted these things on Facebook, all, horrible things about the people that he grew up with. And since I grew up with him, I took that to mean that he was talking partly about me. And I remember reading it, and my initial thing was, well, how could he say this? And he must, you know, be off his rocker or, or whatever one would say. I don't know. And then I thought, well, I, I'm going to message him. I'm going to see how he's doing. 
You know, so I send him something. I'm like, how are you doing? This is not looking good. Do you need a hug? I'm, I don't hug, but I'll send someone to you who will give you a hug. You know, what, what is going on here? You seem, you seem like you're in a dark place. And it opened up an opportunity for conversation. Sometimes we just observe. We, we buy into this privacy so much, which privacy is a good thing. But we think that religion is something that's just supposed to be private, that we don't look at the people around us and say, what's going on? You haven't been here in a while. Did something happen? Did someone say something? Did you encounter something? There have been times where I've reached out to people and they have had a genuine complaint about something that was happening here and we were able to either address that and sometimes change it. Sometimes we were able to address it in the sense to say, I'm sorry, that probably won't change. And then other times it was simply miscommunication. We need to reach out and show concern for the spiritual health of other people. And as a part of that, as a part of that, what ends up happening is that we then start to rejoice in the truth. As I observe the spiritual health of those around us, it helps me then to rejoice in the truth of the gospel and how it has rooted itself into the life of people. This is one of the joys that, that I have. When John wrote that, I and said that he rejoices in the truth and what he hears about these people, I, it resonated with me. Because as a pastor, I've been able to be here for a little while. And I've been able to watch people grow. I, I've, I've been able to watch people grow in parenthood. I've been able uh, to watch people grow as their children go off to college and see how they have uh, transformed spiritually. I've seen uh, uh, people in their middle age come to know Jesus and that, and that changed their direction in life. I've seen older people come to embrace Christ on a deeper level and see that take root in their life and real change happen. And that causes me to rejoice. Having worked with the students uh, for many years, many years, like seven, that's not many, right? Having worked with the students for several years, I was able to watch them grow up. And I remember sitting in weddings or even doing weddings of some of them. And I almost got emotional. I don't get emotional, but I almost got emotional a few times. Thanking God for allowing me to be a part of this. Last week, there were people up here dedicating children. And Pastor Matt alluded to it that some of them grew up at our church. And, and I hope that you rejoiced in that as much as I rejoiced in that, to know that God used us in the lives of these people who now have families. What a joy. And that should, should bring joy in a Christian community. You know, one of the things that I am very grateful for here at this church is the overall tenor of our senior saints, of those people who have uh, given to this church, who have maintained this, this church family, who have sacrificed for this Christian community, I am very grateful for you. Sometimes pastors get together and uh, probably like it is in maybe your profession, it becomes a let me tell you what's wrong thing. Let me tell you what's wrong at my place. And I always feel odd because it starts usually the guy next to me and he'll go around in a circle and I'm last. And these people have horrible stories. You know, someone, they, they slashed my tires um, someone, they're throwing me out of my house, all these kinds of things. It gets to me, and I'm like, I don't, I don't have, I can make something up if you want to feel better. Um, I slashed your tires. I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to figure out something. And, and because, and, and sometimes the complaint is that the, the, the senior generation is making things difficult. Let me say this. I don't find that here. What I find is that people overall rejoice when they see the truth taking root in the lives of young people, when they see the truth taking root in the lives of people in this church, and I see joy. And, and if that's you, if you're of that older generation and you, have, you come every Sunday with joy on your face, and some of you, you know it because I stare at you when I preach because you are the one I need to look at. I always look at the people who are like, so if you don't want me to look at you, just get like that, you know. I, I, I go to those, and that is a joy to us. You, you inspire us in a way and continue to bring that joy. Continue to show that joy to the younger people. Show them how, how, to, how, how to age well in a church and to bring along the younger generations and to take joy when babies are dedicated and marriages happen and young families show up. What, what a joy. John rejoices in the truth and what he's seen and how it's rooted itself in the lives of other people. Then he encourages them, though, to also not just talk about the truth, not just to rejoice in the truth, but listen, we have to encourage the advance of the truth. Understand this, and when we preached through Luke a few years ago, Pastor Matt did a wonderful job 
of helping us understand that we are a part of the kingdom of Christ, that that is the kingdom to whom we belong, that our citizenship first belongs there. So we are ever trying to advance the message of the truth. This isn't some sort of military act that we take on. It's not a political act. It's a spiritual, emotional, social act where we are bringing forth the message of the truth. And we will run into people who have championed that in their lives and in their vocations. And what John says to Gaius is that you support those people. You care for those people. We all have a calling But there will be some, during John's time, there were some that came to the church, would preach the message, would move on to another church, and they would share and encourage in other churches. They would foster help for the poor. They would care for the orphans of the community. And John is saying, you you need to support these people because they are championing the truth. When we give here on a Sunday, a lot of it does help to keep the lights on. It It pays the staff of the church. It keeps carpet. It keeps our building looking nice. But we give at least of our annual budget, at least 10% of that goes outside of this building. There's more of it that goes outside of this building because we collect money for missions trips and other things. I think last year we realized that somewhere near 20%, it would be about 20% of what would be given here at this church leaves this church and goes to people who are championing the truth. We support a church that meets right now at Wayne State University called New Life Church of Detroit. We help support them. Uh, we have missionaries in, in Paraguay and in other Hispanic countries in South and Central America. We are supporting them as they're planting churches. We support some missionaries that we can't even tell you where they're at, just that we support them, and I promise you that's on the up and up. We do that because where they're at, missionaries aren't supposed to be. But they felt compelled to go anyways, and we felt compelled to support them. These are the people that our church supports. There are many people out here that support missionaries on an individual basis. There are many people out here who support other people that aren't listed on any list we have here. We give through our denomination, and it goes to missionaries all over the world. And some of you support other people, like Jim and Marissa Stamberg. Jim and Marissa Stamberg, uh, Marissa is the granddaughter of Dr. Mayhew. She is the sister of Renee Aldridge, our children's ministry director. She and her husband and their family are in Alaska helping to champion the truth. And some of you support them. I could name many others. We do that out of love. We do that out of care for the church, but also out of love for those that will be ministered to. Love compels us to do something. This is one thing that we can do. But love also compels us to be careful. John's talked a lot about this. I'm not going to go into great detail on this, but he does say that we need to be careful of those who stand against the truth. We have to be careful. He gives an example of this man, Diophytes. I, I probably I keep saying that wrong, Diotrephus, sorry. And he gives a, the example of this man who likes to put himself first. He's self-centered, doesn't acknowledge biblical authority, talks wicked nonsense, refuses to welcome the brothers. And John, out of a pastoral heart, names names. And he doesn't back away. He says, stay away from this man. Why? Because John is committed to the truth. John loves his people, and he knows that this man will pull them away, so he says, stay away. Sometimes we tell you to stay away from things. We tell you to stay away from things not in an arrogant way, but we do that because we love your heart. We do that because we want to see truth take root. You know, if ever you're watching someone on television and they tell you to send them money and then they'll pray for you, don't. Change the channel. Or write down the amount, and I'll tell you what, I'll pray for you for half, right? Just bring it to me. Stay away from that stuff. If someone promises that they'll send you something that will heal you, change the channel. Walk away. You know, there are times, and some of you have come to me, and you've said, hey, I was reading in a book, and you'll you'll see my face kind of start to change a little bit. I'm like, okay, tell me what you're reading. And then we, we finish, and I say, you know what? I have a better book for you because that book is not as good as you think it is. So why don't you take this book, and I'll tell you what. You bring me that book that you have, and I have somewhere I can put that. We do that sometimes. Why? Not, not because we're trying to control what you read, control what you hear. No, we want you to have something that's going to lead you towards the truth. I mean, I remember being in seminary, and I had just read a book that I thought was great, fantastic. 
And I'm sitting in class, and, and uh, they're tearing it apart. And, and they're like, what do you think? I'm like, you know what, I'm just listening. Just listening to what you have, drinking in the truth here. I'm like falling out of my chair trying to hide. I had to grow in my understanding of things. I had to grow in my, my knowledge. I'm not there. I'm, I'm still growing. But there are going to be times where we have to be careful of those who stand against the truth. Then, uh, then John, as he, as he gives this caution, now brings us to the point of action. You encourage, you watch out, and we do something. We do something. In verse 11, John says, Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. So here we have a call to action. And when we imitate something, we're, imitate something, we're doing something. We put on display where we are by, by what we do. And so he starts off by saying, do not imitate evil. And a lot of times we move right past that because that's easy, right? We see on television, evil is, you know, uh, the terrorist acts that we see happening in the Middle East, the, the killing of people. I'm not going to do that. That's evil. Or evil is the person that we, uh, that we read about in the news that, that, that kidnaps someone, has them chained into a thing. We, we don't, we're not going to do that. We're not evil. And so there's these large-scale senses of evil that I think and hope and pray that most of us are not pulled towards. But there are these other small-case evil things Jerry Bridges would call them respectable sins that we are drawn into. John says, don't imitate that. Don't be like that. Be like what is good. Here's, here's my worry, because this is what culture's trying to do right now. Our, our culture and, and, and the media is trying to lump the teaching and the appropriate living of the evangelical Christian message into a political movement. And they're trying, and Hollywood and our media is always forever trying to understand Christians, and they can't. They always mess it up. Why? Because they don't get the worldview that we're coming from, so they mess up every time. And they will continue to do that. And my fear is that we will allow them to change the rhetoric of the church into the rhetoric of a political argument. Now, sometimes people are always going to misinterpret that. People are always going to think that Christians are angry people on certain stations of the radio or on TV, that that is Christian America. And you can't win every battle there. But we also shouldn't give in to that. We shouldn't be imitating what is evil. Listen, you can be right about something, and you can be evil about how you share that. You can have the truth and not love. John is saying, listen, it is truth and love together. My fear is that we're going to buy into this concept that in order to help people understand our evangelical Christian biblical message, we have to shout, we have to protest, we have to yell, we have to come up with fancy slogans. We've got to form packs and super packs and groups that in order for us to advance the truth, we have to buy into the vehicle that the world has said we must use. And remember, we're simply not citizens of this. Am I a citizen of the United States? Of course. But my citizenship as a part of the kingdom supersedes that. I will not be told how to act. I will not be told how to respond. I will use scripture to see how I am supposed to respond. And I am not going to imitate evil. I'm going to imitate what is good. And so right now we stand at a, at a unique place in our country's history. I, I was a history student in college. There's been no time like this, people keep saying. And you know what? That might actually finally be true. People always say that, and they're always wrong. This might be the case. And so it is a unique time where people are seeking to understand the church because they realize that they don't. And so we have an opportunity to explain things, but we have to do that not by imitating what is evil, but by imitating what is good. I'm going to give some more examples of this towards the end, but I also want to give a caution right here. 
Because we can be so concerned with imitating what is good and doing nice things and doing good things that we bypass truth entirely. And that becomes a difficulty. This is uh, the most famous theologian of the North American Baptist tradition. His name is Walter Rauschenbusch. Walter was in uh, New York during the early 1900s. He was a pastor in Hell's Kitchen, New York. And he would be, uh, I don't want to say the one that, we, that our theology is based on because it isn't, but he would be the most recognizable North American Baptist in, in history. Walter uh, helped to found and foster what is called the social gospel movement. And his intent was to take Christian ethics and look at social issues through the lens of Christian ethics. And I think that is a beautiful intent. And in that, he founded something called the social gospel movement. The problem became that Rauschenbusch, instead of looking at the gospel, began to look at the social. He avoided truth and went right to love. He didn't look at what Scripture said and instead tried to fit Scripture to fit his view of ethics, to fit his view of what should happen. And so he ends up abandoning a movement that began in Scripture and instead embracing uh, political systems, socialism, and other things to bring about the change that he was seeking. He stands for us as a warning. That is it good to do something? Absolutely. And I'm going to really lean in on that here in a moment. We have to be doing things. But once we start to do things and we ignore the truth from which we come, we become nothing more. You know, the YMCA used to be a Christian organization, and now it has treadmills. There's very little about Jesus at the YMCA. It's not a bad place. But as a church, we are not trying to head in the direction of the YMCA. We're trying to make sure that the message that this church is built upon is here for another 150 years. And the way to do that is to major in the truth and then do something. And that's what we must do. John says we have to be doing something. And it becomes for us a testimony to the truth. Because as I said, the world is going to want to understand us. Always does. Never gets it right. We're weird. We're strange. We don't follow the voting patterns they would want us to follow. Things they think should matter don't. Some people think this, some people think that. How do we understand Christians? So now we have an opportunity to show them, not how we intend to vote, but we have an opportunity to show them what is important to us, what is important to Christian people. And so in doing that, what we do is we add our testimony. That's what John said. I'm adding my testimony about this man, Demetrius, good man. I'm adding my testimony to his so that you know he is a good person. So what we can do now, as we do something, we add our testimony to the truth of how great God is and how it has called us to live differently and to care for things that other people are abandoning. We add our testimony to the truth. One of the great things about America is that we vote. I love that we vote. I took my children to vote. One of them went with my my wife. The other one went with me. One of them thought they were voting. And we had to tell them, you you are not voting. Then we got a whole discussion on why it's unfair. Kids should have the right to vote. Okay. But we took them with us because I love that I get to vote. But understand this, and Christians need to get this. If your chief way of enacting change in your world is how you vote and who you vote for, you're missing the boat. Yes, who we vote for and how we vote is important. I believe that. It's of great importance, but it is not of first importance. If you say that you're pro-life and all that means is every two to four years you download a voter's guide, you go and vote for people, and then you walk out, that's all you do. You're missing out. If you say that, um, that you are concerned about the poverty that, it, that has engulfed so many people in this world and about the inequality that exists in our country amongst classes and even amongst races, if that bothers you and all you do is vote, you haven't done enough. If you don't like the incarceration rates, if you don't like that children are going to jail, if you don't like that some people are jailed longer than others and all you do is vote, it's not enough. We, it, John doesn't say, when he says imitate good, he's not saying just vote if he were here today. He'd say literally do something. 
We have to do something. And so this morning, I've come up with a few things. There's many other things. And these are things that we would call social justice issues. Social justice issues, I believe, are the, the greatest opportunity that Christians have to catch the attention of the world around them so that they understand that we care about people and we love people because the, 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 you know, the narrative is that we don't like people. The narrative is that we only like ourselves. And I, being a part of this church and knowing other believers, know that that's not true. The way in which we can turn that around is by caring about important issues because we care about the gospel. The International Justice Mission is an organization that cares about human trafficking and human slavery worldwide. Some people uh, make the issue out of immigration. They want to build walls. That's fine. But you also, we also need to understand that some of the people attempting to get their children into this country, no matter what, are doing so because if they stay where they're at, their children will be carried away and put into slavery. Now, this is, I haven't downloaded a sermon from, 19, or from 1820. This is today. There are 30 million people living in slavery today in this world. 30 million people. The next World Cup, that stadium being built in Qatar is being built on the backs of human slaves. You can look that up. 30 million people, that's about a quarter of the amount of people that voted last Tuesday in this country. Think about that. A quarter of the, pe the voting people last Tuesday, what if we carried them off into slavery? And yet, sometimes, not my problem. Christians, it's your problem. We have to do something. Some people will say that they're pro-life, and I am tremendously pro-life. I don't, I don't know the, the adjective that I want or adverb I want to throw on there. I'm profoundly pro-life. I am pro-life. If you are pro-life, you have to do something. You can pick it. You can put signs up. You can change your Facebook message. That's fine. One organization is Save the Storks. Save the Storks is an organization that has mobile ultrasound units. And they take these mobile ultrasound units and they park them across the street from abortion clinics so that people can come and hear the heartbeat of their child before they choose to end that life. And many people have heard the heartbeat of their child and gone home and later given birth to that child. We need to do something. And we can vote and we should vote, but that is not enough. This is an organization that you can give to. It's an organization you can volunteer for. Once children are born, we have to care for them as well. If you foster a pro-life ethic, the obvious outworking of that then is orphan care. Bethany Christian Services is a local orphan care agency that you can partner with in some way. If you were to call them and say, I want to help, they'll find something for you to do. Not everyone should and not everyone needs to have a child in their home. But many of us do. There are 400,000 children in foster care right now. If every church in America took one child in, then all of those children would have homes and could have forever homes. It shouldn't be that 13, 14, 15-year-old children have to, go, have to be put on a website to try and get people to take interest in them. People from the church should step up and say, we will take you in. You know, I, I have met people. I met someone on Thursday. Uh, Friday. My wife and I have a foster child who we're hoping to adopt. So just so you know, I'm passionate about this. And as I, we had to get our fingers printed, uh, fingerprints done for the third time because our state loses things. And so as we are, if you work for the state, God bless you, find my fingerprints. All right? And I won't say anything. The lady said to me, I would love to be able to do this, but I just can't emotionally think of bringing a child into my home and letting them go. And my response has become a little snarky one, uh, and it's basically this. Can you imagine telling that to the child? Can you imagine telling the child, I'd love to bring you to my house, but I, it's going to be hard when you have to go home. I can't. Again, not everyone should, but some need to. Some need to. We have to do something. We have to do something. Women at Risk, uh, War International is another organization that works specifically with women who are being trafficked. And there are women being trafficked all around our country and around our state. During the National North American International Auto Show, human trafficking in the metro Detroit area goes up by something like 200 to 300 percent. Women are brought in and then they are taken out. This is happening here. 
And we can't look at it and say it is not our problem. We're to imitate what is good. We're to do something. Samaritan's Purse is the organization that we are working through by bringing these children, these Operation Christmas Child boxes. Samaritan's Purse will take that box and will take it to a country and will give it to another child who wouldn't have a gift. Sometimes these gifts go to the very countries that we're worried about, people coming from them to blow us up. Let's understand that. What kind of a testimony is that to get from a get a box from Christians in the United States to get a box of gifts to help them understand that we love them, that Jesus loves them when all they're hearing is, uh, and this is not meant to be a comment against war, that, they're, that we are we're attacking them. Because in some cases, that's what we're doing. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I think in many cases, we have to advance militarily. But children don't get that. What they get is a shoebox, and that makes more sense. And then incarcerated youth ministries, I don't have a slide, but every Tuesday night, and I think tw two Saturdays a month or something like that, we send people down to the jail to meet with kids so that when kids get out, they have Jesus. And if you care about crime and you say, oh, people keep, they, they get out and they go back, give them a reason not to go back. Give them Jesus. I am praying for the day that we baptize people in here that we came to know through incarcerated youth ministries. And you should pray for that too. Every day. One day, some child, some adult is going to walk through here and their testimony will be, I was in jail and you visited me. We have to do something. There are many other things. And I want to encourage you as you leave, when we leave, we got to do something. I don't know what it is for you. Sometimes I don't know what it is for me, frankly. But it's something. And we figure that something out by having our eyes open, by listening, by looking around us, and by having a tender heart to what God is calling us to do. We have to do something. But remember, the reason that we do these things is not so that we feel better. It's not ultimately to alleviate pain. You don't welcome a child in your home simply to give them a home. We do these things because of the truth of the gospel. And we make sacrifices because all of these things that I've said here, uh, you can do them from the comfort of your home. None of these require any of you to leave the country or the state. They can be done at home. But sometimes they're hard. I know that. You know, those of you who are close to me, you know that, that being a foster parent is difficult. We have wild rides. And I'm not just talking about a car ride. I mean, just a wild ride. It's hard. But it's good. It's joyful. When you step out and you do something difficult, there's a joy in that. And I want to invite you to have that joy, to do something. And we do that because of what Christ has done for us. Sometimes we feel like it's a lot. I hear that sometimes. Well, you're asking a lot. I am. I'm asking for everything because Jesus asked for everything. He says, take up your cross and follow me. Be willing to go where I will send you. Die. Be ready to die. Now, we live in a culture where you don't have to really worry about dying for Jesus, but in other cultures and in other countries, they are. I might be asking you to give your retirement up for Jesus. I might be asking you to sell that vision of a boat and instead embrace the vision of a child in your home. I might be telling you to not worry as much about having that fully funded 401k and instead some of you in here can buy a van with an ultrasound machine. And what, what better testimony for your children than to say somewhere someone's driving a van around with Papa's name on it with an ultrasound machine in it rather than saying, you know what, I'm fully funded so I'm happy. When I went to Paraguay or Paraguay, Prague with my parents, my mom made a joke that uh, coming on, mission, on the mission field, she's spending my inheritance. And initially, it was not very funny to me. It was very serious. I'm like, Mom, what are you talking about? You know, this is, I, uh, you know, I'm counting on that someday. But then I thought, after Jesus got a hold of me, I thought, what a great testimony. And I said, just pour it out. Just spend it. Some, someone from this church will take me in when I'm old. I don't know who. I keep telling my daughter, I look at her in the eye, Dad's going to live with you one day, right? Oh, yeah, Daddy. I, and I'm fostering that now. <laughs> but what a joy. Are we, are we being called to sacrifice things? Yes. And frankly, a lot of us could sacrifice a lot before it even started to hurt. 
And so I want you to pray today. As we, as we come to this, this table and celebrate Jesus' sacrifice, let that be your prayer. First, ask him to look at you. Is there something, some sort of sin in your life that you need to set aside? Lay that before him today. And then say, you know, Jesus, you've sacrificed for me. What can I, what can I do for you? What do you want me to do? in light of the sacrifice that you've given. So I encourage you to take a moment as the servers come forward and just pray and ask God to make those things clear to you.